Game Cool Books, Episode 40, The Usual Mixture of Efficiency and Chaos. Last time we traced the wanderings of Lyra and Will as they separately make important discoveries among the universities, museums, and public libraries of Oxford. Chapter 5, Airmail Paper, opens with the two of them meeting back up. Although it's much shorter than Trepanning, it actually includes almost the entirety of the first book, as told from Lyra's perspective. It sets up the next arc of the story, which will deal with the mysteries of the Torre degli Angeli, and it helps connect all these events back to the disappearance of Will's father, who is present once more in his letters before he appears later in the story. But first, very faintly foreshadowing the very end of the final book and beyond, it shows the relationship of trust and care that's beginning to grow between Will and Lyra. Will is sitting alone on a bench, and then suddenly Lyra is there beside him. It will be interesting to look back at this moment in the light of their promise to one another at the end of the Amber Spyglass to go to a certain bench in the Botanic Garden every year, each in their own world. Those certain moments, like their discovery of the word amber, are highlighted for us by the narrator. This one can easily slip by unnoticed. Will's emotions are certainly much more turbulent right now than that wistful contemplation we might imagine him bringing to the garden bench in the future. Lyra is effusive, ready to tell him all about Mary Malone and her engine that can see dust and perhaps can make it talk. And that, too, looks ahead to Mary's devising the amber spyglass of the third book and to the way dust will indeed speak to her through the cave before she sets out towards the end of this one. Lyra and Will's distance from one another, in short, is figuratively much greater here than it will be in the years to come. The breaking point comes in at their differing approaches to concealment. Both of them, we know, are proud of their skill, but whereas for Will that consists in being unnoticed, in Lyra's view it's all a matter of captivating the attention, even showing off. As she says, it's easy to fool people. Watch. And she demonstrates it on the pair of police who've just been approaching a man and a woman, asking them, or rather, Lyra asks them the way to the museum where she and her brother here were supposed to meet their parents. And so Will has to play along, silently communicating, or lost, isn't it silly? Though inwardly he's furious. Lyra takes what they give her. Uh, the Ashmolean. Yeah, that one. Uh, it's possibly the very place where Will had just taken refuge to wrestle with the death that he'd caused. And once the police have moved on, she teases him with his own words to her uh, from after the traffic accident and over the gold coins. You're not safe on your own. She's pleased with herself for borrowing his own stratagem from that incident and saying that they were brother and sister, which should help with his cover. And just possibly, there's even some mythic echoes here, uh, the curious use of this sort of cover in the biblical accounts of Abraham and Sarah. Meanwhile, Will's heart is thumping with rage. Finally, they have it out setting here must correspond to another real place that's so specific. They walked along toward a round building with a great leaden dome set in a square bounded by honey-colored stone college buildings, a church, and wide-crowned trees above high garden walls. The afternoon sun drew the warmest tones out of it all, and the air felt rich with it, almost the color itself of heavy golden wine. All the leaves were still. And in this little square, even the traffic noise was hushed. She finally became aware of Will's feelings and said, What's the matter? It's 
uh, the color of heavy golden wine, like that Tokai that started Lyra's adventure. And Lyra is no doubt a little slower on the uptake than she might otherwise be, because Will's demon is not visible to show any feelings, and hers, Pantalaimon, is not allowed out to help her observe right now. And so by Lyra's standards, she's been the very soul of discretion. So it's a shock for Will to upbraid her. He says, um, your way, you just, you make yourself visible. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't play at it. You're not being serious. And this becomes a refrain. She retorts, <clears throat> think I don't know about lying in that? I'm the best liar there ever was. But immediately, to fend off any paradoxes, she says, But I ain't lying to you, and I never will, I swear. You're in danger, and if I hadn't done that just then, you'd been, you'd have been caught. Didn't you see him looking at you? Because they were. You ain't careful enough. You want my opinion? It's you that ain't serious. So again, she turns his own words back at him. You're the one who's not serious. And at this escalation, this outrage comes over Will. He says, what am I doing hanging about waiting for you when I could be miles away? It could be safe in the other world. Or rather, he says, the other city. Um, and so she's deeply offended. No one should speak to her like this. She was an aristocrat. She was Lyra. You had to, else you'd never find out anything about your father. You've done it for yourself, not for me. Uh, their fight brings them closer because it more clearly reveals who each of them truly is, what they truly want, how complementary their natures are. It ends here when she shows off once more this time not by lying, but by telling the truth, her ability with the alethiometer. Like when she floored Mary Malone by knowing so much. The effect here is similar on Will. The color leaves his face. He has to physically prop himself up against a wall. So drastic is the shift this knowledge brings. She shows him how she reads the alethiometer, thinking it might reassure him, perhaps. In the midst of a perfectly ordinary day, among the tourists, the ice cream vendor with his cart, like the one Angelica and Paolo were looking for. She's reading. She's doing just what we did in the book's first chapter. As if she had that chapter open in front of her, she tells him all about himself, and Will is appalled. He cries, shut up, that's just spying. And so whatever she had been about to say, perhaps that the alethiometer had told her to help him look for his father, perhaps some other information she was on the point of reading from it, she's derailed, and she has to defend herself once more. She knows when to stop, she says, and that the alethiometer's like a person, almost. Like Will, there are things it doesn't want her to know, presumably things about itself, about dust, or else she'd have gotten the answer she wanted that way rather than having to find a scholar. And there are things that it does want her to know, clearly, as well. The way it chooses to tell her about Will, as we saw, is to call him a murderer, which leads her to trust and to respect him. And unconscious of how she's been ogled in the museum by the old man, she insists that reading the alethiometer is not like some peep show, that misusing it like that would make it stop working, even. She says, I know that as well as I know my own Oxford. So she didn't ask yet if Will's father is alive or dead, and although he's curious, he doesn't ask her to. He's also noncommittal when she declares they've got to trust one another, and she thinks she knows why. The narrator remarks that it's unusually perceptive of her that she sees how Will is mastering his fear, just as Yorick said, 
and just as she did by the fish house, after that other unusually perceptive moment of her self-awareness when riding the bear. She promises Will, not needing him to reciprocate, that she won't give him away. She alludes to her betrayal of Roger, revealing how she has, at least mentally, begun to juxtapose Will with the best friend of her childhood. She's going to try very hard not to let him down, but we might guess that she'll slip up. Finally, Will breaks his silence, changing the subject. He admits that they'll have to hang around after all, at least until it's safe to go back through the window, and so he suggests they go to the cinema to lie low. And depending on uh, whether you count their dinner and breakfast together and going to get Lyra some new clothes the day before, this might be their first date. Will buying the movie tickets, the hot dogs, and popcorn and Cokes. Once again, we see through Lyra's eyes how she's entranced by the film. We see that is something ordinary like a movie transformed into a revelation. We see her gasp with delight. We see her laughter. Her childlike innocence is safely inconspicuous because the theater is full of children. And Will, who's more brooding and focused, if vague, attention has marked him as mature beyond his years all along, Will takes this opportunity to catch up on his sleep. His watch showed a quarter past eight. Lyra came away reluctantly. That's the best thing I ever saw in my whole life, she said. I don't know why they never invented this in my world. We got some things better than you, but this was better than anything we got. Will couldn't even remember what the film had been. So some things are better but this was the best. It's rather different from the photograms Lord Asriel showed, and yet you might remember how wonderful those were in their own way. After repeating this experience at another cinema around the corner, nearly 11 this time, it's safe to head back to the window. Now they're sure they'll be able to go through without being seen. One case at least where Will's way is better. So eating hamburgers, bought from a cart, walking along the, uh, is it the Banbury? Yeah, Banbury Road. <laughs> um, Lyra talks, and Will listens, about the differences between their worlds and their stories. She doesn't like the traffic much, but she's also got to admit she loves the cinema and hamburgers, even if it's a little odd at first to walk and eat. She's excited about her scholar, who shows such promise. And then she goes on to tell him about Lord Asriel's trick for getting the scholars to give him the money he wanted. Will's such a good audience. That is, he's sympathetic, keeping his comments and questions and interpretations to himself, that she goes on telling her whole story. So besides making him stand in for us as readers, it possibly lends further support to the idea that in some sense it's Will, as an older person, who is the narrator of the books. His ultimate reaction here, um, her account of a voyage in a balloon of armored bears and witches of a vengeful arm of the church seemed all of a piece with his own fantastic dream of a beautiful city on the sea, empty and silent and safe. It couldn't be true. It was as simple as that. Which, again, does a real interesting thing with time there. Uh, draws attention to the way in which a dream can seem to go on and yet be very brief, or vice versa. Uh, we can boil down a long story into a few telling images. Now, once they're back in the world of Chittagatsi, they feel as if they're home. 
a weight Will hadn't noticed he was carrying lifted. And this sets up the first real burst of action in a while. There's a cry in the night. Something like what the Egyptians who rescued Lyra from the throwing nets must have heard. Um, Will set off at once toward the sound. And Lyra followed behind as he plunged down a narrow alley shadowed from the moonlight. After several twists and turns, they came out into the square in front of the stone tower they'd seen that morning. Um, so the tower becomes the backdrop for the conflict, and the semicircle of children with their sticks and stones, their fear and hatred, form a mob representing the worst of human nature and specifically of innocence itself, of childlike nature. But that mob gets individualized in a couple ways. At least you have the representative striped t-shirt boy whom Will flings aside, and then Angelica, the only one among them who finds her voice to speak. When Will picks up the tabby cat that they've cornered. The source, or at least the object, of those passions making their eyes glitter in the moonlight is the same cat which led Will through the window the night before. Lyra thinks it's his demon that appeared, though she knows it couldn't be. She'll get the same notion in the final scene with the cat when it rescues them. And then something reminiscent of Mrs. Coulter's metallic anger. There's a current of electric hatred between Will and the boy he shoved out the circle. And indeed, violence will prove to be the only way to ground it. For now, the other children all hang back, afraid and disbelieving that Will could call the cat's bad luck good. Still, their hatred might have overcome their fear, if not for Pan as a spotted leopard growling. And it puts us, at first, in the place of the kids, because we're, of course, surprised as well. But then we uh, move back into Lyra's frame of reference here, as Pan prompts her to look up and see someone in the window of the tower and not a child either. Back at the flat, Will tends the cat's wounds, gives it milk and honey, while Pan, out of curiosity, becomes a cat too. Another powerful image of Will, true empathy, I think. And Lyra watches with fascination, we're told, much as she watched Will make their meal the night before, she knows cats only as working animals, not as pets. Whereas Will, again, has had more first-hand knowledge. He's also a reader. Um, he'd read somewhere that honey is antiseptic, so he puts it on the cat's ear so she'll at least lick it off and clean it that way, although it's messy. And, of course, he's sure it's the same cat. Again, that sense of being able to recognize uh, not needing to enumerate the evidence for a conviction. And he's got some reasons too, though, logical enough. But again, I would draw attention to this, this negative sort of childlikeness and irrationality, that ignorance and that collective sort of madness. Uh, it's brought out here in Lyra's shock at what they just experienced. She's never seen kids like that. All Will says is he has. And we know he's seen it before because we've heard a little bit about him uh, defending his mother from his cruel peers. We'll hear a little more later in this fight at the tower. <clears throat> but his face has closed. And Lyra respects that. She knows she wouldn't even ask the alethiometer restraint again that comes out at times. Only now do we finally get to the scene which gives the chapter its title. It's the thing Will has been looking forward to all day. 
is another poignant image of the power of the written word. Going along with his writing of the postcard to his mom, and uh, even stronger than his fierce attention at the library microfilm reader, he takes his cup of coffee out to the balcony to look into the green leather case. As he'd thought, they were letters written on airmail paper in black ink. These very marks were made by the hand of the man he wanted so much to find. He moved his fingers over and over them and pressed them to his face, trying to get closer to the essence of his father. Then he started to read. In a sense, the scene is itself a love letter to the letter form. And just like that, we're transported to Fairbanks, Alaska, Wednesday, 19th of June, 1985. We learn about Nelson, the physicist, who might remind us of Lee Corsby, because he has balloons, apparently. And Lee's interactions in the next chapter will remind us back of John Perry's here, as he talks with a gold miner about the anomaly over a bottle of Jack Daniels. This Eskimo doorway into the spirit world is part of the initiation of a medicine man or shaman, just like trepanning, as is the bringing back of a trophy, which is also something that Lyra was promised by both Lord Asriel and Tony Costa, and it's something Will's father will close his final letter with. In case something happens, he gives the coordinate location that he's told for this place. 69 degrees, 2 minutes 11 seconds north, 157 degrees, 12 minutes, 19 seconds west, on a spur of Lookout Ridge, a mile or two north of the Colville River. That puts it in the remote northwest of the Alaskan land mass. But then, in a characteristic bit of misdirection, John Perry then turns to other legends, a Norwegian ship drifting unmanned, like the Flying Dutchman, or similar to the premise of Pullman's own John Blake comic series. Not only because of the name, Johnny, but that uh, comic also features a time-traveling pirate ship. The second letter revises the impression of Nelson, and the plot thickens. My darling, so much for, what did I call him, a genial dimwit? The physicist Nelson is nothing of the sort, and if I'm not mistaken, he's actually looking for the anomaly himself. Um, he even orchestrated the delay, as John Perry overhears him telling someone about it. So, he's working with someone else and intentionally messing up the expedition. He uh, plays the bluff soldier. Um, the old Arctic hand, more things in heaven and earth line tended to tease him with the limitations of science. Bet you can't explain Bigfoot, etc., watching him closely, then sprung the anomaly on him. And you know he was jolted rigid. But the uh, more things in heaven and earth course comes from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, the other references here are a little more obscure for me, 
I don't know what the Zyre leopard story is that he uh, uses to cover up noticing how strongly Nelson reacts. If you Google that, it brings up some stories about a dictator who wore a leopard print hat, uh, things about sporting events like the rumble in the jungle, so there's your boxing, pictures of boxers uh, in the cafe, and some things about the 1974 World Cup, oddly enough, because the Zyre team were the leopards, I guess. Maybe there was some witchcraft involved as well. But just to pick out some stylistic elements here, the tone is, of course, conversational, uh, it's playful. John Perry describes the scientist fizzing to get going. That's in the next letter. Um, they're seeking more evidence of early civilizations, civilizations so old as to be anomalous. So it draws attention to that word anomaly over and over. One we would probably need to look up. At least I did the first time I read it. And he also is fond of these sort of filler words, these qualifiers. Um, would you believe, fancy that, things like that, um, or in fact. They're conspicuous element in that conversational style of the letters. So now, on the 24th of June, at Colville Bar, he's passed through Umiat the past few days, by now he's being watched closely by Nelson, who's his closest buddy now, and plays at how he knows that I know that he knows, etc. Um, but he continues to play bluff. And <laughs> he has the uh, what uh, of the hairs in Brian Shake's Redwall series. That I guess it's a military uh, exclamation of some kind. Again, just a sort of a filler word, but one that tells you something about the sort of person who uses it or tells you about the sort of person he's pretending to be. But whoever Nelson is working with, their funding is coming from the defense ministry. And he's got a radiation suit, a la Stranger Things, to which he says, a rum do, my darling. Meaning something strange. But how ironic and cool about it he is. He says he'll play it by ear. In the postscript, later, we have more good luck meeting the Eskimo, Matt Kigalik. Um, by some means, he persuades him that he's not an enemy, like that Soviet spy that he bumped off earlier, and Matt Kigalik lets John Perry into his confidence. He tells him that this anomaly is a kind of gap, a window, you look through it, you see another world. And he refines the exact location for him and gives him a landmark, a tall rock like a standing bear. So some other version of this story might have involved Will actually going there, finding that location. But, of course, he doesn't need to. The window came to him. There's one much closer to home. Though he will encounter the bears eventually. His father was describing exactly what he himself had found under the hornbeam trees. He too had found a window. He even used the same word for it. So Will must be on the right track. So in some sense he is following his father's instructions, 
following in his footsteps or taking up his mantle, as he used to be told by his mother. And in these lines, as his head is ringing, perhaps, we get more of the sort of stylistic elements, even in some ways, that we saw in the letters. Uh, something I didn't mention yet, the use of the dash, the long dash, uh, in place of other more formal punctuation, um, something that you see in a lot of old uh, letters. If you ever read Keats's letters, for example, you'll see a lot of those dashes to connect ideas, sort of loose and uh, scattering uh, uh, thoughts around. Now, there's also this element of them using the same word, a window. Um, they have this kind of shared language. So, and once more, the value of this knowledge is something that makes it dangerous. That importance and that dangerousness are two sides of the same thing, knowledge. In a sweeping review of his life up to this point, we see we'll go from a baby when these letters were written, he was born around 1985, to being a child in the supermarket, to being uh, in these recent run-ins with the men as an adolescent. And despite all of this, he's deeply happy. He had no idea what it meant, but he felt deeply happy that he had something so important to share with his father. This extraordinary thing. And we can't help but see some element of autobiography here. Though it's one Pullman tends to downplay. He too lost his father when he was very young. Uh, he too must have greatly looked up to him. Um, and their names, that is John and Will, evoke the poets Milton and Blake, who have a similarly intertwined relationship. There are other worlds of Christian myth and poetic imagination. And then the name of his mother, which we get in passing here, is Elaine, which could possibly refer to the wife of Lancelot in the Arthurian legend, who is similarly left behind by her husband with the child who would become one of the chief characters in the search for the Holy Grail. Will's wish for the end of his quest is a bit more modest, that he would meet his father, that they could talk about this thing, and that his father would be proud that Will had followed in his footsteps. It's a quiet, and the sea is still. He folded the letters away and fell asleep. So ultimately, the information that matters to Will in these letters is not quite the same as the information that mattered so much to the men who were trying to steal them. It might even be different from whatever it was that his mother saw in the letters, almost certainly is. And they were private to her. She never showed them to Will or even let him know where they were. So there's an interesting combination here of an overlap between Will having this secret that he shares with his father and him having pried into a secret that is his parents. He's able to finally form perhaps a clearer picture of this man that he never really knew. And at the same time, he wishes maybe more distinctly than before to actually get to meet him. 
very moving portion of the story here, uh, one that we're allowed to sort of rest with for a while while we shift back to Lyra's world next time. So, thank you for listening.